dear colleagues, dear friends, during the last uh, 20 years we all have experienced uh, enormous changes in our way of working, of thinking. And this has in fact changed our way to work. But this is probably nothing compared to what we are going to see in the next years, a true revolution. And I think the goal of the current presentation is just to give you an idea to introduce you into this new world, into this magic world, which is going to change not only our life, but also the life of the future generation of cardiologists. Okay, let's discover this magic world of the cardiology of the future and the future of cardiology. The history begin in the 50 years and you see here the decline in cardiovascular mortality in this famous slide of Brownwald. What happened in the 50, 60 years? At that time was the genius, the initiative of single inventors like René Favaloro, who discovered, described the first horto coronary bypass. A single man deciding or inventing a new strategy. Don't forget that only two years later, the man landed on the moon with this famous sentence of Neil Armstrong, a small step for man one giant lab for human being. If you look today, probably the step done by Favalor was even more important than those performed by Neil Armstrong. And only a few years later, Andreas Grünzing developed alone or with two friends in his kitchen the balloon for, for to dilate the coronary artery of a young lawyers, an intervention which really changed the destiny of the modern cardiology. So we can easily say that during the last 30 years, the main decrease in the cardiovascular mortality was uh, the consequence of single initiative of, uh, the, of the genius of some pioneers. But during the 50th, uh, many things uh, have uh, changed in the way of thinking and the way of uh, working. So we can uh, compare the pioneer to the bees uh, working on the flower and the modern world like bees working uh, networked together in a swarm and all working with the same vision, all working with the same strategy and uh, goals. This is what we call today, we define today as the convergence of knowledge. Convergence comes as a result of the sharing of methods and ideas by chemists, physicists, computer scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and life sciences across multiple fields and industry. And you can imagine which might be the consequences for the future when all of these person work together. Let's have a look to this impressive interview. When I think about the future of digital transformation, there's an old story that I find very helpful. And it's a story about the inventor of the game of chess. The legend goes that the inventor took his creation to the emperor of India and showed him the game. And the emperor was so impressed by the beauty and elegance of the game of chess that he said, you can name your own reward. Majesty, I'm a humble man. All I want is a pile of rice. Put one grain of rice on the first square of this chessboard. 
double that, put two grains of rice on the second square, double that, continue on and on, and when we've got 64 squares full of rice, just give me that quantity of rice. And the emperor says, you really are a humble man, make it so. Now, those of us who have had a little bit of math realize how much trouble the emperor is in because that constant doubling adds up over time and it reaches numbers that absolutely stagger the imagination. After 32 squares, there are a few billion grains of rice, which is a lot, but that's about as much as you would get from harvesting one large field. It's only when you get in the second half of the chessboard that things get really, really strange. So by the time they've covered 64 squares of the chessboard, there's a pile of rice bigger than Mount Everest, and it's more rice than has been produced by all of humanity in the entire history of the world. When the emperor realizes how badly he's been tricked by the inventor, he has the guy beheaded. He cuts off his head. So we did some quick calculations. The United States started tracking information technology as a category of corporate investment in about 1958. And if you take the normal doubling period of Moore's Law as 18 months, you take 32 of those doubling periods and you add that to 1958, it turns out that we entered the second half of the chessboard when it comes to digital technology in about 2006. So since 2006, we've seen the explosion of social media. We've seen the arrival of smartphones and tablets. We've seen computers that can now drive cars. We've seen humanoid robots in factories. We have seen a computer be the world champion in the quiz show Jeopardy. All these things have happened since 2006. So to me, that means that we are in some new phase. Maybe we have just started the second half of the chessboard when it comes to the power and the impact of digital technologies. And if what I've just said is true, if there's any truth to it, there's one conclusion. And that conclusion is, we haven't seen anything yet. And I firmly believe that the digital innovations that are going to come and that are going to affect the business world are going to be absolutely transformative in the not too distant future. If that's the case, the only smart strategy at the top of the enterprise is again, to embrace and to start leading the digital transformation for your company. Cap Gemini Consulting, transform to the power of digital. So how can we summarize, define progresses of uh, knowledge? So I would like just to introduce you very superficial contact with uh, five uh, items. Outbreak of big data, exponential technology, digitalization, artificial intelligence, and computational science. Let's start with the outbreak of big data. This is the present time. This is what we observe in our daily life. And you see that between the different steps between basic science, medical evidence, and treatment, we lose an enormous amount of data. data which could be useful for defining strategy for the single for the single patients and this is what we are going to see most probably with the so-called big data we start by collecting data all the available data concerning an enormous amount of patient then we work on simulation and finally, we might end up with by defining personalized treatment, the so-called personalized medicine. The final target of the big data is, in fact, to have for each single patient a well-defined strategy. And this could be the future scenario in suppose uh, let's say 10 years this is a young patient 36 year old uh, woman presenting dyspnea and dizziness and in the future world of cardiology you might collect data from the electronic health record work with a computer algorithm perform a genetic profile rely on wearable biosensor data 
and then creates a unique phenotype and also define, indicate the right treatment for the right patient. So this patient actually suffers from a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with an 83% predicted probability of sudden death in 10 years. So the decision to implant an ICD. This is how big data should work for uh, the medicine and for the cardiology. Let's move to the exponential technology, which is, as you might imagine, a very broad area. You see here devices, devices uh, with a, a high number of companies producing different medical devices. And you see here on the right the mitral valve prosthesis just designed for the percutaneous treatment. And for each single field, there is an increasing number of available and experimental devices. Let's move on to the imaging. These are a fantastic imaging showing the fusion between uh, uh, ultrasound and uh, uh, CT and uh, RX for the reconstruction of the cardiac, uh, different cardiac uh, uh, anatomy with the aortic root, the left ventricle, right, uh, left atrium. And this uh, is uh, going really to change our way of working and uh, treat in a three-dimensional way and in a percutaneous way, the different uh, uh, heart pathology. You see here, which is also very impressive, the new virtual light source technology showing in this case a left atrial appendage device after treatment. And you see that just by changing the virtual light source, you might have uh, different uh, images showing uh, the device. And uh, with uh, this uh, technology, we dispose on already today on a way for the optimal three-dimensional reconstruction of the cardiac anatomy. Then uh, to the robotic. Robotic is a field uh, which is going to expand dramatically in the coming years. This is the, just the beginning. This is uh, Jean Fama Fajadé performing at the last uh, Euro PCR of 2019, a percutaneous intervention, just uh, maneuvering a joystick, just uh, working outside the room and decided where to insert the wire in the LIT on the diagonal branch, but working on a joystick. This is probably not the optimal technology for the conventional PCI, but might be very useful for some complex intervention like the mitral people or other structural intervention. But this is something we are going to see and probably to use in a few years. And uh, if the operator works uh, just on a joystick, you can easily imagine that he will be able to perform intervention staying in his cat lab and performing, his inter performing the intervention far away. So this uh, is going to open new option and uh, the possibility to perform at distance some complex uh, interventions. So now to the e-health uh, technology, which is an expanding technology with uh, all the different uh, wearable devices. Uh, you know some of them and you know the enormous potential of the single devices uh, in uh, assessing, measuring different uh, data, not only the the pulse and sometimes the blood pressure, but also the sinus rhythm are able also to record different complex information like invasive measurement and finally to transmit all of these data 
on a computer and uh, work on the different uh, uh, data with, with the so called telemedicine. This is all the field really in expansion, and we don't yet know what do we are going to see in the coming uh, years. Now to the virtual reality. Virtual reality is a very complex uh, field uh, and uh, we just, some of us, uh, tested uh, the, the glasses uh, or some uh, the helm, uh, allowing you to see a uh, reconstruct, reconstruct uh, the virtual reality. But the final result uh, may be the, what we see in these slides, uh, two surgeons operating and working together in a virtual intervention, one in Chicago and the other one in Munich, working on the same valve. And the big advantage is that they can work together, define together the right strategy for this prolapsing valve and decide together how to perform the intervention on the true patient. Now, digitalization which is also an expanding field concerning the way how to manage information of the single patient and which is going to change the hospital organization, particularly the patient pathway from the reception to the different analysis. And you see that you will have many uh, option will be available to record data and to analyze uh, data and taking a decision. But uh, we will work much more on a magnetic card, uh, on a wearable device, all connected in a digitalized system. This is uh, what uh, in Estonia they are going to uh, develop for organizing the health system citizens, Lee, Martin, and their son, Hugo. While at school, Hugo accidentally broke his arm. The treatment he received can easily be seen by his mother through the patient portal. To enter the patient portal, Lee uses her digital identity, which is tied to her unique personal identification code. This is her doorway into the national health system, where healthcare providers gather medical data related to herself, her underage children, and her grandmother, Viva, who has given her authorization. This way, Lee has an overview of everything related to Hugo's treatment, including doctor's description of the x-ray, as well as the list of prescribed medications. Estonian healthcare providers and people with authorization are allowed to access the medical data, though the patient can always revoke this right. Every query made about the patient is logged, which makes the system reliable and traceable. Now that Lee is fully informed and at peace, she can start comforting Hugo. Let's move now to artificial intelligence. The goal, in fact, is not to understand the artificial intelligence, which is a very complex uh, mathematical word. And uh, in fact, the term define is applied when a device mimics cognitive function, such as learning and problem solving. The information for us uh, is that artificial intelligence and machine learning can support us in taking decision and uh, analyze some data, particularly in the diagnostic field. The way our artificial intelligence and machine learning works is very complex. This is, uh, these are the, uh, net, were the network in 1980. These are the so-called new neuronal network able really to mimic the brain activity by analyzing a simple data, connecting them together and come to a solution for the single problems. And this is uh, the challenge, the future challenge. Uh, and uh, let's see the next, uh, the next moving, uh, the student, uh, the robotic student. Uh. But 
doctor, one of the first in the world, has passed its medical exams with flying colors. Zhou Yi mastered all required medical skills, scoring 465 out of 600 points in China's National Medical Licensing Examination. Researchers from Tsingli University, Beijing spent the last 12 months inputting information from dozens of medical books into his brain. During the exam, the robodoc was forced to show a reasoning process when deciding how to treat symptoms, instead of regurgitating the information back. Wu Ji, deputy boss of the university's electronic engineering department, said, its score is 96 points above the acceptance line. This shows that it has indeed mastered the medical knowledge and clinical knowledge and it has owned the basic ability to employ the knowledge to solve some problems. Although the robot has flaunted his superior wealth of knowledge, researchers have warned he still has a long way to go before becoming a qualified doctor. But Ji said the examinations the robot undertook can help doctors to avoid risks. And according to a recent article published in Le Matin, Dimanche, the artificial intelligence is really going to change our way of working. It will represent an enormous support for the medicine and probably will be able. This is why artificial intelligence is so interesting for the future of medicine, is probably going to dramatically reduce the cost of the medicine, just shortening some de decision pathway and some unnecessary analysis. So, artificial intelligence in cardiology, despite some potential pitfalls, it is becoming evident that the best way to make decision on the basis of data is through the application of technique drawn from artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence will become essential to the practice of clinical medicine. So we will, we will all be faced with this expanding field. And I think we have all to learn which information can artificial intelligence provide us. And we will have to learn how to use in this important information and this will probably happen sooner rather than later and the final topic is a computational science computational science is the way to reconstruct anatomy physiological pathways to mimic some complex situation and this reconstruction can provide as useful information and can be used for predicting some scenario and to help in deciding for a therapy. And you see here uh, the computational cardiology used for reconstructing the depolarization and the repolarization of the single myocardial muscle. And it is impressive how this reconstruction is reliable, reliable in defining the depolarization, the movement of the electric signal. So we come now to the end of my presentation, to the conclusion. So I come to the conclusion of this short presentation of this a short introduction in the future of cardiology and in the cardiology of uh, the future. First of all, willingly or unwillingly, our future will be very different from what we have experienced for so many years. Secondly, some areas are already changing our daily activity, digitalization, exponential devices, Others are still in a phase or premises like big data robotics that could lead to a real revolution in the way we think and work. So our way of thinking is really going to change. And the consequences might be very important. The organization of our activity will inevitably lead to a progressive specialization with a decrease in individual skills but at the same time 
in a progressive increase in a team skills. We will work more and more in a, a team a philosophy like the B Swarm. And this is what could be our future. This is, uh, you see, a very nice uh, uh, picture by showing Martin Sharko visit, visiting uh, his uh, patients. And you see all the young doctors working together and learning from him, from his uh, clinical experience. I think the role of the doctor will probably remain the same. But uh, our colleagues uh, are going to change uh, and uh, we have to work more and more with the big data colleague, with the digitalization colleague, with the new technique, with the care team, with artificial intelligence. So the team will be much different from what it is today. The doctrine should remain the same. And uh, finally, I think uh, what we have to learn is to work uh, together in the same, with the same vision, with the same activity, and try not to get lost, because if we, can, if we get lost, we might then enter in a huge disaster. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a wonderful virtual meeting.